when we identified six or seven of them, they're almost identical to what it was at that time. And so uh, nothing changes, everything continues. Um, I think I'll make it really brief, and so I'm going to introduce Bruce Mill, hopefully the next mayor of the Seashell. Thank you and welcome. And if you've lived here for a little while, you know that microphones are really important in my life because I've got the softest voice of anyone here. So this is working well and we want to thank Dan Thanks. I want to, this evening, do two things. There's two really important parts and then lots of other things that we're going to do. The most important is to make a confirmation about the campaign starting. So the first part is sort of an official uh, welcome and it comes from the uh, sense of comfort. We do want to thank the people who helped me put this together um, this afternoon. Um, Doug Wright, who you'll meet later, is one of the uh, candidates. And Alan Tom Morris, we're here to Alan uh, Keeps, is uh, back at the table there. Uh, David was here with us, and Bob uh, spent at least an hour and a half trying to get his computer to work with this projector. And that was pretty frustrating, but let me tell you, we were just watching and waiting and holding and hoping it was going to work. Um, the only other welcome I'd like to say to all of you, and I'll try to um, to you as we move along, I want to acknowledge that we are in the traditional territory of the Seashell Nation. It's great to see different faces that I see and recognize here and there. So thank you, thank you all for being here. Welcome to the introduction, we're doing that now, confirmation. I want to speak about why we need change. I want to introduce confirmed candidates that we know of. I want to talk a little bit about the campaign because it might be different than any other local campaign you've been involved in. It's going to be a community-based campaign and it's not going to be a military-based campaign. And then I'll make some final remarks. That, um, and that can all be over in about 20 minutes, so you can mostly spend your time talking to the candidates that are here and getting to know who they are, shake their hands, look them in the eye, start making your assessments about who we want to bring together um, to bring forward the seashell that we know we want to have. That's me. <laughs> I didn't see Tella yet. Where is, is Tella? I wanted to thank Tella. So that, her name is just on the bottom there. And, uh, I'm scrolling up. Let's officially say that the worst kept secret in the seashell will be announced. Yes, I will be a candidate for mayor in November 15th. People have been asking me for some time when I was going to declare, and I kept saying, look, the election isn't until November, we don't, want to, we don't want to peak in August and then go downhill from there. Um, but um, I think the first few phone calls were from Ann Kershaw, a counselor that I worked with in 1996 and 1999, and she was saying, Bruce, you've got to tell people you're running. Come on, Bruce, when are you going to say that? And eventually, I said, well, let's start telling people I'm thinking about it, I'm serious, and yes, I will, but I still wanted to wait until after Labor Day and after the, uh, at least we were into the two months before the campaign, before announcing that. We have 60 days, and I wanted to call this a launch, 60 days and counting, but I didn't get David to write a song for me uh, with that title, so we have no music, but we will be looking for campaign songs. So that's the confirmation part. Why do we need change? If you're here tonight, I probably don't have to tell you why we need change. But the number one issue, the main issue we're dealing with, Seashell is integrity and trust. People simply don't trust their local governments. I want to talk about public decisions being made in private. I want to talk about uncontrolled spending on misplaced priorities, and there's a long list of those. And I want to talk about economic development, which is more about smoke and speculation than it is about community-based community development. Let's start with the first one, public decisions in private meetings. And uh, we've seen this in spades over the last while. This council has had more regularly scheduled private meetings, in-camera meetings, than regular scheduled public meetings. 
They have four in-camera meetings a month. They have two regular public meetings a month. They have twice as many in camera. We don't know what they do, but staff tells us that the agendas for in camera are like this, and my fingers are about two and a half inches wide, and we know that the public agendas are about this, about half an inch thick. They like to do their business behind closed doors. I don't think that's necessary, and we'll talk about that later. We notice that they're making decisions because we see voting blocks without much discussion. Something will come in front of them, we'll see the vote off in the 5-2 split, and we can talk about that later. But when councillors vote without discussing things or without lengthy discussion, it tells you that they've discussed it somewhere else before they got to the meeting. And I'm talking about before they get to committee meetings as well. Yep. And we've watched rehearsed performances. There's five or six people in this room that attend almost every council meeting. Sam Jackson is one of them, Shirley Kusia, uh, Lynn Forrest, Gil Conway. And we can tell when a performance is rehearsed. Because the ramp starts and it runs off and then it's finished and you can just tell it's a rehearsed performance. And that tells us that other decisions are being made about who will speak, how they'll speak, and what they're going to say. We actually don't need that, but it's one of the reasons we need change. Reckless spending on misplaced priorities. I'll let you think about that for a minute while I get my water. Golf course fiasco. Our government decided to take a local business to court, a business that they've been in partnership with for 14 years, in which the local, the previous councils explained the situation, signed affidavits, said this is the, what the situation is. And this council decided to pursue them anyways to try and break that golf course. It's cost us $573,813. And we've got nothing from it except wasted legal fees. I still pay for it. Legal fees in two years, 2012 and 2013, the legal fees, $985,000. I know things have changed since 1999, but I asked Victor Member, the financial officer, what he thought the legal fees would be for a town about our size under normal circumstances. Oh, he said about $100,000. That may be high, I don't know, but $100,000 or 985000 over two years, we don't have the numbers for 2014, we can wait. Severance pay and staff turmoil. We know that one of the first things they did was change the chief administrative officer, that happens. They hired somebody with absolutely no experience in BC and no experience in local government and no experience with the local community charter. He left in six months and they hired another person with no experience in local government and no experience with the community charter. We know that 28 people have left the district since this group came into power. We don't know the cost for that. I've got a question mark. We know that the severance for the, for the chief administrative officer, for the director of finance, Andrew Busi, for the uh, director of corporate services is probably in the five to six hundred thousand, we know that the IT director was asked to leave after the strike and given a uh, comfortable payout that he said he was very happy with and wouldn't have to work for some time. I know from 1996 when I was at the SCRD board and we restructured that organization after some very tough negotiations and lots of legal counsel that we changed seven employees and it was close to a million dollars then in 1996, 97 I should say. So this 1.5 is probably modest, but I only have a question mark because this is all in camera. We don't know how much it is. Airport planning and marketing. $100,000 $100, on the record. And we don't know, we do know that this $100,000 does not include the trip back in January of 2012 when Councillor Chris Moore and Mayor Henderson flew up to, Hen to Calgary to visit the West Jet. Board meeting. So we don't quite know where that is. That came under airport development, but it wasn't in this 100,000, which is straight planning reports and marketing. And I'm going to come back to the airport a little later. Seashell Innovations Limited, $300,000 in the first move, um, which was a share that we transferred, $200,000 in this year, $500,000 to Seashell Innovations Limited. And we know their entire five out of their seven board just resigned. The chair who had been there for longer and wanted to stay or would have stayed if circumstances been different. We have absolutely nothing to show for half a million dollars to the Seashell Innovations. 
That's the business attraction group. This is the one that's going to go out and market seashells and bring jobs here. There are no new business licenses. I didn't mention here the gravel road in West Seashell that was paved in 2012 for $600,000. I didn't mention, can't hear me? I did not mention the gravel road in West Seashell that was paved in 2012 for $600,000. Heritage Road. It's usually left for developers to do that kind of work. We decided it didn't need to be, or they decided it didn't need to be. I don't mention the doubling of the communications budget in 2014, so there can be the rash of pre-election meetings and receptions that you're watching now, and the extra advertising you're seeing in the last six months. I haven't mentioned the golf course. Sorry, I didn't mention the golf course. I haven't mentioned the sewer plant. We will talk about the sewer plant over the next 60 days, but I don't want to talk about it too much tonight. I think it's not actually the main issue in this campaign. But the difference between an environmentally sound tertiary treatment of our septic system, system our sewer system, and the Henderson model, $7 million. We had one of the four bids that came in that met all of the technical requirements at $18 million one of the four bids in it, $18 million. We've checked this with the Director of Finance. He says, yes, we should have been able to do it for about $18 million if we took a conventional tertiary environmentally sound approach. We took another approach. The difference was $7 million up to $25 million. That, to me, is about misplaced priorities. Of course we needed a sewer system. Of course we needed it to be upgraded and to make sure that it was environmentally sensitive. Do we have to buy the $25 million one if an $18 million project will do the job environmentally to the same standards? Airport expansion. At the airport barbecue on Saturday, where they brought in some guest speakers from Kelowna and other places, they said to round it off, the airport expansion they're thinking about is $12 million. They're looking for a three-way split, $4 million for the municipality, $4 million for the province, and $4 million for the federal government. And that's good news because the federal government and the provincial government will not be coming in until there's a business plan, and there is no viable business plan, and there hasn't been after two and a half years of work on the airport. The primary motivation behind the airport expansion is to move $12 million from public funds into three or four contracts that will move that into private hands. Somebody will get the contract for the road building, sand and gravel that goes in the bed of the tarmac and for clearing the extra footage we need. Somebody will get a contract for paving the tarmac. Somebody else will get the footage we need. Somebody will get a contract for paving the tarmac. Somebody else will get a contract for the new electronics and lights that we will need on the runway and there will be enough money left over for a terminal building. Four contractors will benefit. It'll take about two years to build. And at the end of that time, there's not a single new scheduled seat coming in and out of this airport. They have absolutely no viable business plan. There's no courier service. There's no airplanes. There's nothing to make it any different. Except we'll build it. Some people will benefit. And we'll be left paying. Plus, we'll have operating costs. In the next 60 days, we're going to try and bring somebody from Powell River down here who can talk to us about the operating costs of an airport that isn't well used. There's a huge annual expense. I think the main issue around the airport expansion, and the only reason they can actually make sense of it, is when they talk about it in terms of development of industrial land, which means land speculation. They don't know there's a market for industrial land, but they think there is. We did a study in 1999 on the airport on, on what it would take to bring scheduled flights here, what it would take for industrial land. Nothing has changed. The rule of thumb in terms of industrial land, which is about how close you are to YVR, how close you are to the rail yards in New Westminster, and how close you are to Roberts Bank, hasn't shifted. That's about congestion. It's about the time it takes for trucks to get in and out of those three spots. And when the province decided to do the south of the Fraser, Gateway project, which was you can see if you drive to the ferries or not, they put industrial land on the Sunshine Coast back at least 20 years. So don't be thinking it's going to come soon. The airport advisory committee did their own study in 2012 and out of town. 
We have many stop promoters close to the council. We have customers. I, I do want to take a digression later to talk about uh, medical marijuana. It's a pretty confused subject, and it involves self-interest, conflict of interest, um, medical use, zoning issues, which are the major problem, and a genuine concern of neighbors in terms of security and issues of that um, type. So we do really want to look at it. If they push all the zoning through that we expect in the next um, six weeks, I can tell you when elected mayor, we will deal with the zoning. I will hold town hall meetings in January to ask this community what they really want and how far they want the zoning. <laughs> next um, six weeks, I can tell you when elected mayor, we will deal with the zoning. I will hold town hall meetings in January to ask this community what they really want and how far they want the zoning. However, it's on this slide because it's an example of the kind of communications and marketing and spin that we get out of this council, as if they're creating economic development, but it's mostly talk, and it's mostly marketing, and it's mostly about something that might happen or not happen, and it hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened yet. Seashell for sale. You just have to walk around the downtown area or somewhere else and see how much of our town is for sale. Residential real estate. I have a good story that the mayor told one night at the council. He had been at the Driftwood at a meeting, and his um, little car was out in front. And when he came out of the meeting, um, a tourist was there and was talking, looking at the car. They started talking, as he usually does, about the car. And when he introduced himself and said, well, I'm the mayor, the tourist from America turned and said, what's wrong with this town? Well, John was kind of taken aback. He said, well, what do you mean? You know, this is a great town. Um, we love it here, and there's lots of opportunity, lots of business. Um, opportunities. And the, the visitor said, well, I just drove in here an hour ago, and everywhere I look, there's for sale signs. They're everywhere. Well, if you've lived here long enough, you know in spring and summer, there's a lots, of, lots and lots of sale signs. And that's one reason I won't be using lawn signs in this campaign, because I don't want the realtors to win the election, because, you know. <laughs> so, no lawn signs. So, John was telling, Mayor Henderson, John was telling us this story at council because he said, can't we do something about all those real estate signs? <laughs> he didn't say, what's the reason there's so much for sale? How can we improve the market? He said, what can we do about the communications? Well, even Councillor Moore, who's in realty, sort of stepped back a bit and said, you know, maybe the realtors, maybe the people, Darnell just said, well, maybe the people who own those houses want them to advertise. Uh, but John's first response was, what can we do about the signs? How can the campaigns are run? I also know how the last Fats campaign was run. And I don't believe you can fight fire with fire. I, mean, I am a political scientist. I have been studying politics a long time. And I think we need to have a community campaign that takes things a little bit differently. So this will be an organic campaign. It'll be grassroots. And it will be based on what you do. We are the candidates. I might be a mayoralty candidate, but it's your campaign and you need to take charge. You need to take charge of the way Aunt Kershaw did when she started phoning me and say, Bruce, are you going to tell people you're running or you're not going to tell people? And then she got other people to phone me until they were phoning me. And then finally, I think it was a phone call from Barry Poole. He said, you know, Bruce, we didn't always agree on the council, but when you were mayor, if you run for mayor again, I'll support you. In fact, I thought he was going to be a candidate, but somebody had to talk with him and said, uh, 